This is the year for making changes. This is the year for moving on. This is the year of overcoming. This is the year for growing strong. This is the year for a new way of thinking. This is the year for making plans. This is the year for reaching out. And this is the year for joining hands. Gone all the lonely nights of yearning, gone all the dark and cloudy skies, all the unsteady bridges burning, all of the doubt and all the lies. And this is the chance to recapture the power, this is the time to abandon the fear. This is the moment, the finest hour, this is the year, this is the year. And this is the year that I put into action all my desires and all of my means. And this is the year that I follow my passion. And this is the year of my dreams. This is the year I'm letting go of trying to change the ones I love. <laughs> this is the year I turn it over. This is the year I look above. This is the year that I take my intention, turn it away from distraction and talk. This is the year I take the step, and this is the year I walk the walk. <laughs> this is the year that I put into action all my desires and all of my means. And this is the year that I follow my passion. And this is the year of my dreams. This is the year I make it happen. This is the year I follow through. And this is the year I move ahead on all of the things I want to do. And this is the chance to renew my commitment. This is the time to be conscious and clear. And this is the moment for living fully. This is the year. This is the
The scene was one Sunday, 11 a.m., in a conference room somewhere in space. One by one, all the celestials dropped in until all of the host was in place. Refreshments were offered, some white fluffy cake and a kettle of warm steamy milk. Everything served up on porcelain plates on a table of linen and silk. May I bring this meeting to order, was heard, and I'll turn to the head of the room. I welcome you all to this high-level council. We've plenty of work to resume. A steno stood up with a pad in one hand and announced the agenda in rhyme. There's the matter of buckling Orion's belt and of cleaning the Milky Way's grime. And someone's donated two huge pearly gates And they're stirring up quite the big fuss For to make matters worse now The Salvation Army has given those darn things to us <laughs> But firstly and foremost This weekly assembly has holy intention and worth For we've gathered together to work out the plan For the placement of heaven on A poet took the podium and offered a prayer Where our vision falls short, may we see May we do all we can to ensure that all beings will be The blessed they can be Two nurses continue by pleading for peace And for gentleness, Joan of Arc beamed And the good Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Said a prayer for all those who had dreamed the floor is now open, the research committee will render their statements and notes. And when we've heard all the proposals, then everyone makes their decision and... Yes! So one by one, chairs were stating their case, saying heaven should be here or there. Some lobbied for down in the deepest of oceans, some argued for up in the... Air. But when all was concluded, it was quite apparent that this was a point on which few could agree. T'was no simple matter deciding just where this dominion of heaven should be. At last in the silence a small voice was heard from a humble and timorous man. My name's Murray Goldberg. I'm still on probation. But I think that I got a good plan. It seems I've been spending my lifetime alone in my search for my soul and my source. And I've shunned the distraction of my fellow beings for the fear that they throw me off. Yet when I get together with one or more others, there's nothing that feels so divine. To be in communion with sisters and brothers must surely be heaven's design. So how about we scrap all these blueprints and plans and instead we install it by parts. And we put a large portion of heaven deep down in the corner of everyone's. Again, there was silence. And then an explosion, unanimous beating of wings and of legs. And the meeting had gone from the night to the dawn. So St. Benedict started some eggs. Very good. Not so much in the first service. <laughs> Harriet Tubman went off for her train. St. Bernard went off walking his dog. I'm taking a couple of tablets, says Moses. More so in the first service. <laughs> While Murray was simply a gog. You were here in the first service. But from that moment forward, the issue was passed with a permanent home by decree. Where two or more beings are gathered in love. Here the realm of all heaven shall be.
I heard somebody had a hard day out there. I had a hard one too. We could count them all up and see who wins. Who do you think will have more, me or you? Feeling sorry might work, but not for long. We don't have the luxury of time. So I've got an idea, and it might help us both. And it starts with a question of mine. What can I do for you today? How can I help in some small way? It would be such a gift to me. It's true. If you let me do one little thing for you, what can I do? There's a whole lot of things that I can't make, can't build a house or meditate. But I know there's one thing I can create. Oh, I can make some time. Though the older I get, the faster it flies. Spend it like crazy, no surprise. When my pockets are empty and my credits decline. I'll know that at least I gave you some time. What can I do for you today? How can I help in some small way? It would be such a gift to me. It's true. If you let me do one little thing for you, oh, what can I do? Such a noisy and crazy earth out there. We are neighbors in crisis everywhere. Just in case you were thinking that no one cares, someone may prove you wrong. People all over this world need love, and some won't be lucky to get enough. That's why I am hoping that you'll understand how we'll both get ahead. If I give you a hand, what can I do for you today? How can I help in some small way? Would be such a gift to me. It's true. If you let me do one little thing for you, what can I do? And that's kind of my question, but I won't ask for uh, a rhetorical question today. But I hope that you'll take something from our time together. And what's better, uh, you know, in a time when the world's in such crisis than to get together in person? So we're already there. This is extra credit from this point forward. And a, uh, a retired Unitarian Universalist minister from New England once told me that you have to get to church early on Sunday to get a seat in the back. <laughs> if I didn't know better, a person could get a complex, you know? But thank you. I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, my sister, my old, older sister, is a retired Unitarian Universalist minister. She's living in Providence, Rhode Island now, near where I live on Cape Cod. And... When Deborah left a career as an architectural lighting designer to pursue her Master's of Divinity at Andover Newton in Boston and explain Unitarian Universalism to my family, uh, it was a little too complicated for me to understand, but I tried to put it in simpler terms, and I asked her if this is what it meant. It's a place where you go to have your answers questioned. <laughs> Just food for thought. <clears throat> 
If you're new to hearing me, I'm going to read a short letter that will explain all you need to know about what it's like being on Planet Dave for a few minutes. And I'm very honored at the invitation, and I want to appreciate Glenn and all the folks here for a lot of email contact to help put this service together and let me know how things went around here and how much flexibility we had and all that. So, uh, A nine-year-old girl was dragged to one of my concerts about five years ago in Washington, D.C., against her will by her parents, who were old friends of mine. And I went up to this nine-year-old girl at the intermission, and I said, Alana, I haven't seen you since you were a baby. It's great to see you. Are you totally bored to death today? (laughs) And she thought for a moment and looked at me rather pensively. And she said, well, actually, I'm kind of rather enjoying this. And her dad was behind her going, (laughs) highest form of praise, I was to understand later. And then about a month later, I got a letter from her father, Grant, um, a letter. You guys know what a letter is. Not younger people don't. You know, and uh, and Grant said it was great to see you. Uh, and it turns out Alana had to write a paper for school the week after your concert. And I thought you'd get a kick out of it. I just found it on my home office desk. And he enclosed this paper. It's got a great title. It's called David Roth <laughs> by Alana Baldwin. David Roth is my hero because he writes songs, great singer, guitar player, and sang at my parents' wedding. David Roth writes funny songs and inspiring songs. The funny songs make people that are even down in the dumps laugh. His inspiring songs like Yes We Can, Practice Makes Progress. What? Did you say perfect? Oh my God, no. I have a song called Practice Makes Progress because perfection is prison, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm here to shatter the illusion of perfection. I've inserted 17 mistakes into this sermon and song so I don't have to bear the burden of a flawless presentation, but instead can celebrate imperfection. Can you celebrate that with me this morning? Okay, good. Uh, David's inspiring songs like Yes We Can, Practice Makes, and some others make me have confidence, courage, C-O-A-R-A-G-E, and encouragement. The new best word in the English language, encouragement. So I hope if you have no other takeaway from our time together this morning, you will have been encouraged in some degree this morning because it's a tough world out there and must be faced with cooge. So look at the person on either side of you right now and say, have cooge. Would you say that? Have cooge. <clears throat> okay, that's enough cooge. Alana continues, David Roth has been playing guitar and singing for over 20 years. He's tall, skinny, and has gray hair. I'm amazed that even how, even how old he is, he can still get all of the high notes. That's about all I'm going to read of that. That's all that's really needed there. All that is to say, I don't take myself too seriously. I pick and choose my spots, you know. But today we're going to talk about the power of yes. And I'll invite Glenn to slide over to the piano to play a song he only heard one time. That was during the first service when I threw some sheet music in front of him. How about Glenn, huh? But there's a little story that goes along with this, 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 this first song, and this is a two-song sermon in song, okay? So it's only two songs, but there's some story that goes with it. Because uh, uh, about 10 years ago, I wandered into a little cafe in Orleans, Massachusetts, on Cape Cod, where I live, and uh, I approached the owners who were standing behind the cash register, and I said, listen, um, my name's David, I'm about to make you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> and they looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said... I'm looking around at this beautiful little cafe. How would you like to have absolutely free a night of community music in here? You know, it won't cost you a thing. You just have to stay open late one night. And they said, we would love to do that. We've always wondered how we could have live music in our cafe. And I said, I (laughs) am your man. Because in the 80s, I, I went to the open mics in New York City for 10 years. That's where I, that was my training ground, and I took my numbers with Sean Colvin and Suzanne Vega and Jack Hardy and Rod McDonald and Cliff Eberhardt and all the great folk singers and many great ones that you might not have even heard of, but that's where we, that was our training ground, and I said, let's have an open mic in December, and it was 2005, and they said, that sounds great, what's an open mic? I said, it's where anybody who wants to can come sing, play a song, tell a story, 
um, read a poem, whatever they want. And the only criteria is that freedom of speech is held high. You know, anybody can say or sing anything they want. That's important that we have freedom of speech. It's an important part of our country. And they said, well, that sounds great. So we, we looked at the calendar, and we picked out De- December 12, 2015, 2005, and it also happened to be the night of the full moon. So I said, we'll call it the full moon open mic, and it'll be free. won't charge anything. And I discovered on December 15th, which was six days before I had my thyroid out for my thyroid cancer, that I had struck a nerve on Cape Cod because uh, in December we have what are called the year-round people, not the summer people visiting their second homes, but the year-round people, my friends who work from Memorial Day to Labor Day, scurrying to make as much money as they can to last through the year. You know, the restaurant people, the hotel people, the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters, all my friends. And so December, this was a good measuring stick. Well, when I put out the word for this little cafe, which had about 10 tables and 20 chairs, about 75 people piled in that night. And I realized, ah, an affordable night out on Cape Cod. It doesn't exist until... December 15th, 2005. But that wasn't it. It was also the call to community. The call, it was, you know, Michael Smith, my friend from Chicago, says the coffee house is what church is supposed to be. Now, where you feel connected and we're under an umbrella of loving music and, and, and brotherhood and sisterhood. So all these people showed up. And when they did pile in, I have to admit, I grabbed a bucket out of my car, my Honda Element, 241,000 miles and counting. And I scribbled a note that said, free will donations for Habitat for Humanity of Cape Cod. I figured, hey, if I can send Habitat 20 bucks the next day, no, no amount is too small if you've ever been in social services. And I put the bucket out. I didn't pass it around, you know, put it in on the spot. I said, hey, there's a donation bucket if you can throw in a few bucks, my year-round people, my friends. So 16 people played. One of them was a teenager named Crowbar. I never forgot him. And at the end of the night, I kind of peeked over in the bucket, not 20 bucks, 200 bucks from my neighbors, crumpled bills, coins. And I decided this was an idea worth continuing. And 10 years later, we'll have our 10th anniversary of the full moon open mic on December 14th, 2015. Come on up, all expenses incurred. (laughs) But it's free when you get there. And you can all stay in my living room. No, just kidding. Um, and we'll have our 10th anniversary. And uh, I've done it about four or five times a year to my schedule when I'm not touring, which is what I do full time. Uh, we've collected for a different nonprofit every time, cumulatively over $12,000, just from a few coins and a few bills in the bucket. So it's turned into a great event. A hundred people come and uh, it's just something really looked forward to. And, you know, 20 to 25 people now play one song each, one story. And uh, we now meet at the Brewster Ladies Library in the rumpus room, as I call it. And we have potluck snacks. Some are gluten-free. It's just a great thing. So about four years into this, I get a phone call at World Headquarters of David Roth Music which is the upstairs bedroom in our house on Cape Cod. And it went something like this. Hey, is this David Roth? I said, yes. He said, well, uh, we haven't met, but I've been coming to your open mics, and I love them, and I'm a big folk music fan. I've been taking pictures for Pete Seeger for years. My name's John Economist. But the reason I'm calling is I'm the director of a low-income housing community on Cape Cod called Mashpee Village. Have you ever heard of us? I said, no. And he said, well, the reason I'm calling is I've got some teenagers who are looking for stuff to do after school in this community, and I'm concerned that they'll get into uh, the drugs and alcohol and violence that's really prevalent with a lot of teens on the Cape. And I thought, I don't know, I just thought if I could call you up and see if you'd come out and consider doing a a two-hour songwriting workshop with my teenagers around Thanksgiving. And I put my hand over the phone and I said, teenagers, (laughs) folk music. I won't have what he's having. I said, John, let me stop you right here. You know, I got to tell you, when I hear someone tell the phrase to me that includes teenagers and folk music, the first phrase that comes out of my mouth is, yes, I'll do it. He said, did you say yes? I said, yes. And he said, teenagers and folk music? Absolutely. He said, I thought you'd say no. And to myself, I said, I thought I would too. But my mouth said yes, because something spoke before something kicked in. 
That would have been a no-brainer to say no to. And I find as I grow older that when my no is so reflexive and so automatic and so default, that's worth looking at. I take a step back. It's like writing that intense email and sleeping on it instead of hitting send right away. Aren't you glad you did that sometimes? Well, that's the same thing. When someone asks me a question and it's an absolute no, I step back and I think about it before. And I've learned a lot by doing this. So I said, yes, I'll do this, not knowing what in the world I would do with teenagers and a guitar, except the only thing I could do on that day, show up and be in the present moment because suffering only comes from thinking about the past or the future, but only 100% of the time. So I said, yes, I will do this. He said, that's great. I can get you some money for this. I said, no, I don't want any money from this. If I need money later on in life, I'll call you. And that goes for you, too. I've got a clipboard with phone number space out there. If I need later on, I'll get in touch. But so far, so good. And um, we set it up for about a week before Thanksgiving. And around that time, he emailed me and said, I got 14 teenagers signed up for your workshop. And I called up and I said, this is fantastic. <laughs> and I went there to Mashpee Village the next week, a week before Thanksgiving that year. And sure enough, in the common room were 15 chairs, one for David and 14 for the teenagers, and not one showed up. (laughs) However, the preteens, 6 years old to 12 years old, heard there was going to be music in the common room that day, and every seat was filled. The kids weren't sitting in them. They were on the edge of their seats when I walked in. Are you the music man? I said, yes. (laughs) What are we going to do today? Well, my name's David. I'm a songwriter. Would you guys like to write a song today? That's what they did. How many hands went up? 14 kids. 28. They were all over it. And I said, I have an idea. And they said, what? And I said, how about we write, spend the next hour to write a song about how to make the world a better place? And they said, yeah, that sounds great. And I loved them immediately. Kids, they didn't all have parents. Some lived with cousins or friends or uncles. And they had nothing. Nothing ever came there. And they could still step out of that picture they were in to see a bigger picture. They stepped out of their frame, and they just enthusiastically said yes and reinforced that idea for me that yes is a very, very powerful thing when no seems kind of obvious, right? So uh, I asked them to uh, each write down, and I brought them each a really nice pad and a pen that I had collected from a conference the previous month where all that stuff was being thrown away at the end of the day from the tables, you know? So I'm like the Robin Hood of office supplies, And I gave them each a pad and pen, which they could keep. And uh, I asked them to write down a couple things, you know, about how to make the world a better place. If I were to ask this side of the room, what's a specific thing someone can do to make the world a better place? Love. Love, okay. How about this side? Gun control. Yeah, a little advanced for 6 to 12-year-olds, but, (laughs) you know, less cat pistols or something like that, you know. And we went around, you know, after I gave them five minutes to write their ideas down. And every once in a while, we'd stop. And and an hour later, we had the words and music to a song. And uh, the adults came back for a lunch with a potluck, stuff from McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the best they could do. And it was beautiful. And we sang them our brand new song, and many tears were shed. Not a sad song. Tears of joy. Tears of happiness. Tears of relief. Pride, accomplishment, wonder, whimsy, amazement. We did that. Connection. A lot, a lot of great things. So I thought to illustrate the power of yes that I would play this song we wrote with those kids. Are you ready to sing our song? Yes, because it's a call and response song. And Courageous Glenn, he's got a lot of cooge, I should say. He's going to join me on this, and I'll sing it back. Now, Dick, I know you heard this in the first service, so don't no give away the lines, all right? I got my eye on you. All right. A hundred years, my foot. Here we are, here today, here to sing, here to play, make this world a better place for me and you and the human race. If you had a bad day, you could turn it around, play some tunes, crank up the sound. Hand in hand, lost and found, turn your frown 
upside down. Oh, know that we can be ourselves. Oh, that's a very nice word, kids. What are we going to rhyme with selves? Shelves? Elves. The, the kids said elves. And I said, okay, I'm going to need a couple minutes on this one. But three kids said, no, Mr. Roth. I said, call me David. I said, we got this. I sang, know that we can be ourselves. They sang, witches, fairies, ninjas, warlocks, and elves. Fourteen kids. Really great. Let's write this song. And then let's eat. <laughs> Let's have some fun in the sun. Love our world. Love our town. Let's go green. Save the bees. Save the whales. Save the trees. Oh, let's have some chicken pot pie. Oh, that's a nice word, chicken pot pie, kids. What are we going to rhyme with pie? Sky? I, and then another kid said, Mr. Roth. I said, call me David. He said, I got this one. And then gave one of the greatest lines of any song written of any genre that I've ever heard. I sang, let's have some chicken pot pie. He sang, we'll have lunch with the FBI. Then we can fly, we can fly in the sky. My, oh my, everybody. FBI and here we see a turkey giving thanks for you and me cause we won't eat him today vegetarians okay move around a disco dance take a risk and take a May you have perfect feast and may the world have perfect peace. Here we are, here today, here to sing, we're here to play, make this world a better place for me and you and the human race. in outer for me and you and the human race and that's the power of yes so thank you very much <laughs> funny you should ask I won't sing the song but I'll, the next song but I'll tell you that a month later uh, John called me and said, hey, Dave. I said, yes. And uh, he's from New York. You know, he's living on Cape Cod. He says, the teenagers heard about your workshop. <laughs> and now they want a piece of the action. <laughs> <laughs> so I got together with three of the teens who had written poetry about uh, the lack of affordable housing on Cape Cod and their fears. And we wrote a song together called Everything That Happens Makes Me Stronger. That's what happened, and now we've you know, forged that connection even further with the kids in that community. You know, they're all different kids now because they've grown up and moved on, and, uh, but I get to go back and visit the kids who are there now, and all because you know, that default no, that automatic no, somehow came out as a yes, and it has enriched my life in more ways than I could tell you. Sing along if you like to raise your voice in song with me. Very easy. I am here for the greater good of all. The greater good of all. The greater good of all. I am here for the greater good of all. The 
greater good of all. Would you sing that with me? Here we go. I am here for the greater good of all. The greater good of all. The greater good of all. I am here for the greater good of all. The greater good of all. You are here. That's it. You are here for the greater good of all, the greater good of all, the greater good of all. You are here for the greater good of all, the greater good of all. We are here. We are here for the greater good of all, the greater good of all we are here for the greater good of all greater good of all play one Glenn We are here. Here we go. We are here for the greater good of all. The greater good of all. The greater good of all. We are here for the greater good of all. The greater good of all. Last line again. The greater good of all. 